C'est bon Yeah, Dr. Sean. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Beam, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Boston Scientific, for setting up uh, this um, webinar. So I, I think, as, uh, as Dr. Beam, I think, uh, clearly mentioned, uh, so I see my role as setting up for the setting the scene up for the main talk, I think, which comes in the second part of the program today. So I, I thought, uh, and according to the agenda, I, I thought we'll just overview um, the, the pacing indications, um, according to the recently published guidelines in 2021, uh, the ESC guideline, cardiac pacing. Um, so I won't be focusing too much on cardiac resynchronizing guidelines. I thought I'll just overview um, for the audience uh, some of the, uh, the updated concepts regarding the evaluation of a patient who may need uh, permanent pacing and a snapshot of the guidelines, since I think Dr. Binkley mentioned the guidelines are vast and huge. Um, with various subsections, I think it would be probably, you know, um, appropriate to offer a snapshot of the guidelines as it stands uh, today. Um, so moving on ahead, so I thought I'll just start with um, uh, the guidelines this time has a, a devoted area towards the evaluation, the basic evaluation um, pathways of a patient who needs uh, permanent cardiac uh, pacing. So I thought uh, I'll just uh, you know go through go through that uh, go through the workflow where so the initial evaluation of patients with symptoms suggestive of bradycardia in, in, in the recent guidelines and I, I think this all reflects our current clinical practice. Um, it definitely I think moves through the different spheres of evaluation, starting of course right from the history uh, of a patient in terms of the um, history of the symptoms, syncope or presyncope precipitating factors and other cardiovascular risk markers, which can be noted. And of course, uh, the symptom, the, the history is symptom guided or symptom directed in this instance. A family history, of course, is quite significant, especially as we are moving into the era of, um, of uh, recognizing more and more genetic disease within large families. I think the family history is extremely important. Um, if you have multiple members with a similar pattern of uh, symptoms, then I think probably it, it gives us an indication as to what we might be dealing with in the index patient. And also it enables us to counsel the at-risk family members, the other family members in the family. And of course, uh, a, big, a background um, snapshot of the medical therapy, because as we already know, men, a whole range of medications can present with conduction, with conduction issues and thereby leading to the symptoms of the patient. Um, it need not be emphasized that a thorough physical examination often is definitely warranted because sometimes you may pick up extra cardiac features or extra cardiac signs, which may direct ourselves to the underlying fundamental disease. It may not just be, it, it, rather the focus should not just be on the symptom and the conduction issue. It should be rather a search for an under, underlying or a fundamental a disease process, which may be able to explain the whole the whole uh, sy whole uh, symptom complex. And of course, the electrocardiogram is a basic in, in, uh, interrogation tool in all patients who present uh, with symptoms suggestive of bradycardia or AV block, which is mandatory. And of course, the relevant cardiac imaging tool, of course, ECHO is the often first step that we start off with. And uh, advanced imaging tools such as MRI are essential when we are trying to determine the structural substrate for the electrical problem that we see, whether it be bradycardia in the form of sinus node dysfunction or AV block. So um, I thought uh, I'll just give a basic clinical context as to before we just dive into a snapshot of the guidelines, probably this will give us more perspective as to what we may be dealing with. So um, after the initial steps of uh, patients who have come with symptoms of just bradycardio conduction system disease. And after they have gone through the initial workflow, which consists of the history, physical exam, ECG, and imaging, we, we come to certain, uh, certain uh, aspects where if the patient, let's say, has uh, bradycardio cardiac conduction system disorders, which have often been noted during the sleep period, um, now the guidelines, they recommend that, um, um, you know, there is more and more data which is accrued now, which has a close correlation between severe sleep disorder, sleep, severe sleep disorders and cardiac conduction system disease. So, so the guidelines have uh, given it a fair, fairly high rate of evidence of a class one level C, 
uh, for the uh, for the purpose of conducting a polysomnography or sleep study, especially when there is a temporal association between um, bradyarrhythmias and um, and the period of uh, sleep, especially during ambulatory ECG monitoring. So, so that's something which is quite significant. And of course, in our clinical practice, we do see a lot of patients who have severe sleep disordered breathing, and often we do see that you know at times their their um, ambulatory ECG monitorings are also populated by uh, conduction system disturbances, um, especially during the time of sleep. So. Uh, the second aspect is um, it's not just uh, the the conduction system; it's the other param it's the other um, the other historical features which must be noted. For example, if it's a fairly young patient, um, if it's a patient in whom the conduction system has been has has rapidly progressed. For example, let's say we see a patient today with just a baseline right bundle branch block, but then he you see him probably a year later with a high degree AV block and uh, and other forms of, of bundle branch blocks being manifest on the ECG. So when we deal with uh, patients who have um, a, a quickly progressive conduction system disease on follow-up, uh, or when you have patients whose families have multiple family members who've received an, a pacing, uh, uh, who received a pacemaker for, for various indications. So these are all red flags, which tells us that, you know, that this is not the usual kind of, uh, uh, of, of a situation where we're just dealing with a, a, some sort of a, a quote unquote a degenerative uh, conduction system disease. So these are red flags, which, which tells us that um, we might need to perform um, you know, a, a, a multi-generational family pedigree chart and try to find out uh, what is the cause, what is the pattern of inheritance and if necessary, probably administer a genetic test after we have you know, confirm the type or the phenotype um, in, in the patient and other family members uh, as well. Laboratory tests will help to a substantial extent. For example, you may be dealing with probably hypothyroidism, electrolyte disturbances, hypocalcemia, hy hyperkalemia, um, and such related disorders. So a laboratory tests, a standard panel of laboratory tests are often mandatory when you're sort of investigating patients who come with symptomatic uh, bradycardia. When the initial imaging uh, imaging data, of course, the imaging initial imaging step, of course, it's an echo, uh, is suggestive of, let's say, uh, there are features of infiltrated cardiomyopathy, then definitely, I think, the next step in advanced imaging quite often, the next tool is cardiac MRI. If you're suspecting an infiltrated cardiomyopathy, such as um, sarcoidosis, the, the choice is often a PET MR. Um, a hybrid platform where you're trying to understand the metabolic aspect in terms of the imaging data as well as the structural aspect and that often illuminates um, as to what we could be dealing with fundamentally. Patients who present with uh, just syncope and let's say just a bifascicular block on, on the baseline electrocardiography um, of course there is uh, a sufficient um, evidence which has been accrued uh, in this particular patient subset an electrophysiology study or exercise testing for exercise induced uh, block um, has been recommended and uh, with the level of uh, with the 2a level of evidence uh, b in the current uh, guideline and of course you can you can sort of um, uh, skip that step of evaluation if the clinician determines that the um, patient is uh, belongs to the elderly and frail subset, in which case an empirical pacemaker may be considered. So that too comes with a, a with a with a with a fairly a steady level of evidence in the current guidelines. What about patients with suspected uh, recurrent reflex uh, syncope? So a carotid sinus massage, head up till test till table testing all have a high level of evidence in the current guidelines, class 1b. Uh, Patients who present with symptoms suggestive of bradycardia conduction system disease, and especially they have exercise-induced symptoms. So they've had a fair, uh, a large uh, uh, trial, uh, a large sort of data uh, has been accumulated over the last decade or so concerning how to test for these patients or how to value these patients. So exercise testing is firmly recommended class 1 level of evidence C. And of course, um, exercise testing can also be considered in patients with suspected chronotropic incompetence just to confirm the, the initial clinical impression. And generally in patients with intraventricular conduction disturbances or AV block of unknown level, probably exercise testing may be considered to sort of uh, uh, unmask uh, the level 
of um, of block, whether it, it could be an infranodal block. So, so that has a level of two class two B, the level of evidence C. So, overall, I think the key message is that um, it's it, the the aspect of an of symptoms in the background of bradycardia and convection system disease. It would be it would be to the patients and it would be to the patient's advantage uh, definitely if uh, one were to systematically go through uh, these different uh, evaluation steps and try to understand um, where we are in terms of identifying the uh, fundamental disease and of course trying to understand um, uh, trying to understand uh, whether this information gained by doing these tests will also help us to predict. Uh, the, prognos the prognosis in such a given patient and the family. So what about monitoring? So in patients with, the, so the guidelines, I think they've just uh, mentioned it, uh, the role of monitoring in patients with infrequent, let's say infrequent symptoms, probably less than a month or so with unexplained syncope or other symptoms, which can be attributed to bradycardia. And the initial evaluation, of course, did not demonstrate a cause. Then long-term ambulatory monitoring, such as a loop recorder, is um, the evidence is quite uh, is quite robust with a class one A recommendation. Uh, ambulatory monitoring, of course, this is something which we commonly do in clinical practice, uh, especially in patients who we suspect may have uh, bradycardia, uh, suspected bradycardia, to correlate uh, the rhythm disturbances uh, with the symptoms which the patient has presented with. So again fairly robust evidence. And again, this is uh, re-emphasizing what is currently being done in clinical practice. So with, with this background, I'll just uh, give a snapshot of the current recommendations for pacing in, in, in the various uh, Brady arrhythmia subset. And, and so, so that uh, the clinical context has already been set. And now we just come to the, uh, to the hardcore recommendations uh, per se. And I think pacing is definitely indicated in sinus node dysfunction when the symptoms can clearly be attributable to that. I think the guidelines have remained fairly stable in that regard with a high level of evidence of 1B. And, and of course, patient uh, pacing is definitely indicated in symptomatic patients with the, with the tachybradyform of sinus subset of sinus node dysfunction. And of course, uh, this is ordered in order to uh, correct the bradyarrhythmias in terms of pacing. And of course, this is also to enable us to, to initiate uh, pharmacological therapy for the tachy half of the syndrome. Uh, of course, the option of uh, ablation of the tachyarrhythmic uh, subset or half uh, is always present. Uh, in, in patients, of course, who present with uh, chronotropic incompetence have clear symptoms during exercise. Exercise is a clear um, historical factor here in those instances. Uh, DDD with rate responsive pacing definitely should be considered in that subset per se with a 2AB level of evidence. What about ablation, AF ablation here in, 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 in that aspect, in this particular subset? So it could be considered as a strategy according to the guidelines to avoid pacemaker implantation in patients with AF-related bradycardia, or, or they may have symptomatic pre-automaticity pauses or probably brady after AF conversion. And of course, this is taking into account the clinical situation. So this is at the as a physician's clinical discretion, taking into account uh, uh, a patient by patient uh, on a case by case uh, basis. Of course, in patients with the uh, tachybrady subset uh, variant of sinus node dysfunction, uh, programming of atrial ATP mm -hmm. may be considered. So that has a level of evidence of two B uh, class two B level of evidence uh, B. But what about patients uh, in whom they have syncope um, and they have uh, ACE or, or, or in patients with syncope, cardiac pacing may be considered to reduce recurrent syncope when asymptomatic pauses due to sinus arrest is documented. So, so these are patients where you may have an asymptomatic pause documented perhaps on an ambulatory ECG monitoring, more than six seconds, and due to a sinus arrest. So there's a so the, the recommendation is of a class 2BC in this regard uh, for patients um, who have this finding documented on the ambulatory ECG monitoring. What about patients who, are consider, who, who may be considered to be in the sinus node dysfunction subset uh, when the symptoms are likely be due to compradi arrhythmias? Probably the ambulatory monitoring data set here is not very conclusive, but um, there is enough clinical suspicion to, to sort of think uh, that pacing, uh, that uh, the symptoms are due to uh, bradyarrhythmias. And, uh, and when the clinical impression is of sinus node dysfunction in that particular patient subset, pacing is reasonable with a class 2B C level of recommendation in that uh, aspect.
So moving on to uh, recommend, what are the current recommendations for pacing for AV blocks? I think this, these are fairly straightforward and have not changed uh, much in terms of uh, reclassification. So, so definitely a high level of evidence uh, for pacing for patients with uh, in sinus rhythm with uh, could be high permanent or paroxysmal third or second degree type two. It could be infranodal two is to one or high grade AV block irrespective of symptoms. So that's been fairly consistent. Um, what about pacing in patients with uh, atrial arrhythmias, mainly AF, and they have permanent or paroxysmal third or high grade atrioventricular block uh, and irrespective of symptoms, even this patient subset um, has a fair level of evidence, a robust evidence uh, to go ahead with permanent pacing. And in patients with permanent AF um, in need of a pacemaker, uh, ventricular pacing, of course, with the rate response function is recommended. So that's class one to the level of evidence uh, C. And uh, pacing should be con also should be considered in patients with uh, second degree type one AV block that causes symptoms or is found to be located at the intra or infra his level at EPS, EP study. So, so this, uh, uh, this subset needs to be probably qualified by an additional uh, data set, which comes from an electrophysiological study. And, uh, and you have, once you have that data set in place, uh, probably pacing is uh, reasonable in that in these subset of patients as well with the 2A C level of recommendation, um, and and quite clearly, and I think uh, this is this is a, this has been a traditional consistent message um, um, for all of us over many decades that pacing is definitely not recommended in patients with AV block due to transient causes could be um, high degree very severe hyperkalemia. Uh, Etc. Reversible causes that can be corrected and uh, and prevented, or or it could be medication induced. What about recommendations regarding in, in the ESC guidelines for pacing in patients with um, with bundle branch uh, blocks? So in in patients with who present with unexplained syncope and let's say with a bifascicular block, um, if there is additional data that the patient has. Uh, a baseline HV interval of more than 70 milliseconds, or he has a second or a third degree infra, or intra or infrahesian block um, during in, in incremental atrial pacing, or an abnormal response to pharmacological challenge. So in this subset, if the patient has an unexplained syncope and you have some of the uh, data sets, uh, for some of the features in this data set, uh, pacing is considered, is considered with a fairly high level of evidence in the current ESC guidelines. Uh, pacing is also indicated in patients with alternating a bundle branch block with or without symptoms, as this is often considered a, a, a forerunner to advanced, um, advanced uh, conduction system disease. And there's no question regarding that patient subset where, pac where pacing is uh, firmly recommended. Uh, it can also be pacing can be considered in selected patients who, let's say a patient presents with unexplained syncope, has a bifascicular block, um, you don't have the additional data set of an electrophysiological study. Here it becomes more of a clinical decision, especially when the patient subset we're talking about are elderly, frail patients. Uh, they're high risk of a fall and they have recurrent symptoms, which have probably led to trauma. In this case, I think, again, clinical wisdom, physician discretion comes into play and pacing may be a reasonable option in this patient subset also, even if you don't have the, um, especially when you don't have the additional data set from the electrophysiological study. Now, pay, what about pacing for asymptomatic bundle branch blocks or bifascicular blocks? So definitely there's no indication as of now, it's class three, uh, a completely asymptomatic individual and uh, there, there is uh, asymptomatic bundle branch or bifascicular block, no recommendations for pacing as of uh, the current iteration of the guidelines. Let's move on to another patient uh, subpopulation subset where patients present with reflex uh, syncope and um, probably we, we all have our fair share of patients who belong to this particular subset. So in this particular subset, dual chamber cardiac pacing um, is recommended uh, to reduce recurrent episodes of syncope in patients who have aged more than 40 years and who've had a severe, uh, severe sequence of symptoms, severe multiple episodes or severe unpredictable recurrent syncopal events. Now, especially when they have spontaneous documented symptomatic asystolic pauses of more, of more than three seconds or asymptomatic pauses of more than six seconds, which could be due to a sinus arrest or AV block, or they may have the cardio inhibitory subtype 
of the carotid sinus syndrome or during uh, till testing, they had an asystolic syncope uh, um, during the test. So when, when these factors, one or more, are combined with the, uh, the, the, uh, the clinical picture of multiple episodes of syncope, which are recurrent, often unpredictable, there's a fair level of evidence to go ahead with dual chamber permanent cardiac pacing. Dual chamber cardiac pacing may also be considered in patients who have multiple syncopal episodes, uh, with the clinical features of uh, adenosine sensitive syncope, where you can you can give you can administer an adenosine challenge, document an adenosine uh, uh, a conduction issue, which may be sense which may, may be amenable to dual chamber cardiac uh, pacing, especially in the subset of patients who have recurrent syncopal re uh, recurrences uh, in this uh, aspect. What about cardiac pacing uh, in the absence of a documented cardioinhibitory reflex? So in patients who present with a probable uh, reflex syncopal uh, setting, uh, if you cannot document uh, a, a cardioinhibitory subtype of a reflex, um, in, in this patient subset, uh, pacing is clearly not recommended. So um, I'll just finish up um, with, um, Another different subset, and uh, I, of course, there are. In, in the, if you look at the entire guidelines, there are there are various other clinical scenarios. For example, post heart transplantation, post valve replacement. Some of some some guidelines concerning uh, timing of uh, permanent pacing uh, in those patients. But I chose TAVI because um, a, 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 as a as a different subset because this is something which is uh, increasingly being done, and um, and post tabby conduction issues are something which all of us practically face in, in, in our clinical practice. So this is something which I think we should be aware of and um, of the data in which direction the data is going in terms of a post tabby conduction system uh, disease. So if you look at the general principles of the management of conduction abnormalities in patients after tabby, so if the patient has a persistent high degree AV block, or a new onset alternating bundle branch block post procedure, and I think the work, the 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 path is fairly straightforward, and 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 the recommendation is firmly in favor of permanent cardiac pacing. What about patient who's who's come for TAVR who has a pre-existing right bundle branch block and who has a new post procedural conduction system disturbance? Um, so, although the evidence is not as robust as for the previous uh, subset. There is uh, fair evidence to suggest uh, in certain longitudinal studies to show that these patients may also benefit from permanent uh, pacing, although the level of evidence is slightly inferior class 2A. Uh, the recommendation is slightly inferior class 2A. Now, what about patients who have new left bundle branch block with a QRS of more than 150 milliseconds or a PR interval of more than 240 milliseconds? with no further prolongation during serial monitoring more than 48 hours after procedure. So this is a sort of a, or sort of a gray area where, where most of the weight of clinical evidence uh, is in favor of watchful waiting. And uh, these patients are often in the West, they're often allocated to uh, you know, 20, 24 or 48 hour telemetry ambulatory ECG monitoring. This is something which we also have reflected in our practice where we, do ambulatory ECG monitoring for these patients, seriously trying to understand for the progression in terms of the quantum of conduction system disease. Or you can probably make the jump to an electrophysiological study. And again, again, both of them have class 2A recommendations. So this is, this is probably an evolving uh, subset where the jury is still not out, uh, but then probably we, we can sort of pursue these two strategies to try to understand what is the a degree or the quantum or severity of conduction system disease before making a clinical decision to offer permanent pacing therapy? What about patients who come with pre-existing conduction abnormality with the prolongation of QRS of more than 20 milliseconds, or let's say the PR of uh, more than 20 milliseconds? And again, um, um, ambulatory ECG monitoring, uh, again, post-procedure with the class 2B recommendation or uh, an electrophysiological study. So again, the level of recommendation is a little in more inferior than the previous uh, subset. And again, this would represent another area, another gray area where sort of the data is evolving and um, evolving and gradually uh, developing. 
so so to to really to really to summarize um, um, in terms of um, post tavr patients, I think permanent pacing definitely recommended in patients with complete or high degree AV block that persists for twenty four to forty eight hours. There's no real confusion there. Uh, new onset alternating bundle branch block again. Alternating bundle branch blocks are always a forerunner to more advanced conduction system disease, or rather, it is already advanced conduction system disease, and therefore has a high level of recommendation in terms of evidence uh, for permanent pacing. Uh, permanent pacing may be considered, let's say, a patient with pre-existing right bundle branch block who develops additional conduction disturbances in on top of RBBB. Um, again, um, not the same quality of evidence as the first two clinical subsets, but probably could be uh, considered. And as we mentioned, uh, the other two subsets where it, it's just new onset LBBB with a QRS of more than 150 or a first degree AV block with a PR of more than 240 with no more uh, evolution in terms of the, uh, of the severity of uh, the initial conduction system disturbance probably just needs um, you know, close watch, telemetry, or symptom guided, and then make a clinical decision regarding that. It's a gray area, to be honest. And again, uh, patients with pre-existing conduction system disease, it, as we mentioned, QRS of more than 20 milliseconds or a PR more than 20 milliseconds, um, um, QRS prolongation more than 20 milliseconds, rather. So again, this is a slightly gray area where, again, discretion, monitoring, and watchful waiting seems to be the way to go. Definitely prophylactic implantation is definitely not indicated before TAVI patients with RBB and no indications for permanent pacing. So TAVI implantation techniques are, of course, are evolving. If you look at the implantation, uh, how it's evolved over the last uh, decade or so, where higher and higher implants in some of the major high volume centers have consistently they have gotten away with um, a very low pacemaker implantation rates. So I'll end here. So uh, in summary, I thought um, we'll just have a look at the clinical context, some of the principles of evaluation in patients who come with bradyarrhythmias. And I thought we'll just give um, a snapshot of the current pacing guidelines before we move to uh, the exciting topic of, um, of uh, physiological conduction system pacing uh, by the next speaker. Thank you for your patient listening. Hi, Dr. Hisham, that was succinct, I would say. Uh, there's only one question in the chat box uh, that's on conduction system pacing. I think we should wait to sure. hear Dr. Arun before answering that. Sure. I, I thought you would uh, have uh, put the prelude of uh, indications for conduction system pacing based on the ESC again. I think we'll hear that from both. Yes, I think, yeah, I think the, uh, because I think there will be significant overlap. Yeah, so because no, no, I, I think, yeah, so, we, so he's going to begin both with you after the. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Hi, Dr. Arun. Dr. Satish, I, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So one question was there in the chat box from Sopna for uh, Isha. If you find out a uh, AV block uh, during sleep study, how you're going to approach? Yes, so that's that's very interesting. So um, I, I would sort of be concerned if it's asymptomatic and it's just uh, AV block during sleep study and I find that the quantum of um, obstructive sleep apnea is quite severe. Um, um, I, I think my focus would, would be definitely on uh, correcting the severe sleep apnea. And I think there is a lot of data uh, which is being uh, accumulated, I think, in terms of uh, asymptomatic uh, high AV blocks during sleep and uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And there's some evidence um, in terms of, and there's a lot of evidence with atrial fibrillation as well. So, so I think if it's asymptomatic uh, AV block during sleep uh, with a very severe form of obstructive sleep apnea, I think my focus would be clearly on, uh, the, my, the, the, the priority would be to definitely uh, aggressively intervene for the uh, sleep apnea. Uh, I think uh, I, I think yeah, I would yeah. take that I, as a logical step. Uh, yes, Dr. Yes. Beam? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that, which is a predominant yeah. problem, OSA, or actually it's a syncope with AV block. Yeah. So de de uh, depending on which seems to be predominant, uh, I would address that. I, I would kind of agree with uh, Dr. Hisham. Uh, although we don't see this often, I would yeah. think we are seeing more of AFib with OSA than yeah. um, a, a conduction system uh, or AV blocks with the OSA. In a scenario that we see this, I would still think uh, if it looks like a predominant OSA, so which is primary, which is secondary, is a clinical judgment that we, we need to make and then take a call. Yeah. One more clinical relevant thing is that 
Is there something called drug induced uh, AV block? Well, uh, drug triggered, I would say. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody was predisposed or would, uh, it depends on the age, age group and most no, of these uh, patients will eventually end up with, uh, I mean, uh, current yes. practice is to stop uh, the offending drug for five half lives and see if the AV block resolves. Uh, this is a paper in circulation 10 years back uh, saying these population uh, where they stop the drugs after five life, five of life recovery of conduction within one year, nearly 30% of the patients required uh, pacing. So mm -hmm. now for normal conduction system should not be uh, get uh, geopardized or disturbed by these uh, drugs. Or beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Agree, agree, Dr. Satish, but uh, such patients, if you, uh, if you wait and then implant later, uh, it's not, it's not a bad strategy. Okay. What, how do you approach uh, nowadays uh, AV block in younger, younger age group patients, Isham? Um, no, to be, uh, no, in the, in the sense, uh, probably I think speaking uh, in terms of, um, I think some of the uh, congenital AV block patients, um, I, I think the, the fair level of evidence, I think is uh, pro-pacing now towards more of, uh, um, I, I think in our pediatric cardiology program as well, I think we've uh, seen a trend towards, um, yes. you know, advising more of, um, it, leaning towards advising pa these patients mm -hmm. towards uh, conduct. In towards this patient, conduct going patient. towards imaging, a patient coming with AV block and yeah. third or fourth decade, yeah. how aggressive on imaging aspect to look for? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's a, that's a, it's a, that's a great question. I think it's very important because um, I think recently I just demonstrate with a recent example where we had a, a 40 year old gentleman uh, who came with a high degree AV block. And uh, of course, you know, it's, it's the fourth decade. You don't anticipate, you know, much of a degenerative disease in this population. Interestingly, his family history revealed uh, that uh, he had uh, six other family members who had sudden cardiac deaths and all of them had died, let's say, less than 40 years of age. Um, so we imaged this patient. He had significant uh, LV dysfunction, something, something resembling a DCM uh, phenotype. And we sequenced him uh, his, uh, genetically and it turned out to be lamin A cardiomyopathy. So I think you're, I think it's a, it's a great question. I think young patients coming with um, progressive conduction disease, malignant family history, I think imaging and probable you know uh, appropriately administered genetic testing sometimes might reveal uh, what's happening uh, on the fundamental level in terms of the baseline disease. Because nowadays we are looking so many of uh, inflammatory cardiomyopathies. Yes. Normally the patient is not temporary pacemaker dependent. We uh, we do uh, MRI and look, uh, rule out infiltration. If the patient right. is TPA dependent after pacemaker, we get PET CT and uh, we see uh, quite a lot of um, inflammation happening. Uh, right. It's also, it's, I think it's um, a very it's good point that you made. It's also important that I think uh, some of the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, ACM, uh, some of these desmoplaking mediated cardiomyopathies, they have an initial phase of uh, myocarditis phase. So when you might do the PET in the inflammatory phase, sometimes it might resemble something like sarcoid, but it's not. Um, again, so again, advanced uh, phenotyping and genotyping may help there as well. So there's an overlap uh, in certain instances. Do you have any questions? Well, I thought we are. Uh, we need to go ahead with. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's my privilege uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Arun Gopi, next speaker, who will be speaking on uh, conduction system pacing. Arun Gopi did uh, DM cardiology from PGM Chandigarh, MD medicine from AIMS New Delhi, and he did uh, fellowship in EP in Care Hospital Hyderabad. He also had international fellowship in EP from Milwaukee, USA. His area of interest is uh, diagnostic electrophysiology and radiofrequency ablation and uh, cardiac pacing. So, and uh, I think recently has done uh, atrial fibrillation, cryoablation also. I think first person to do it in uh, Kerala. I welcome uh, Arun Gopi for this exciting uh, topic, conduction system pacing. Dr. Arun Gopi. Um, sir, am, am I audible? Uh, You're audible. Yeah. Uh, let me just try to share my screen. 
hope my slides are visible now. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, one good evening, John. Uh, uh, thanks, Satisha, for the introduction. Uh, respected Deem, sir, uh, dear Hisham, uh, and uh, my dear colleagues, a warm uh, good evening. And at the outset, I thank uh, Boston for the opportunity. So moving on from a prolific speaker, we have uh, another talk of the town talk topic uh, that is uh, physiologic pacing. So uh, I understand from the chat box that there were some queries on this as well as Dr. Bean put it across. So I hope um, Hisham would clarify the, the queries after I finish up my talk as well. So the topic for today is physiologic pacing. So let's um, start this topic with a case scenario. This is just a hypothetical case scenario, a middle-aged person had congenital complete heart block. And as Isham said, um, most of the, uh, the current uh, tendency is towards pacing these people. He had normal LV function, he un, uh, but he was symptomatic as well. So that makes it more of a case to get him paced, underwent a dual chamber pacer. And uh, as you all would know, most some of these patients come back with heart failure, with progressively declining LV function. He is fully paced on ECG and on the device interrogation, worsens to class four despite optimal medical therapy, and he was referred to a transplant center. This is just an hypothetical case scenario to just put across the concept of what we call as pacing uh, induced cardiomyopathy or, or pacing induced LV dysfunction, which actually opened up the horizons for uh, development of this newer uh, talk of the town that is physiologic pacing or conduction system pacing. So we all know the detrimental effects of chronic RV pacing. Typically what we talk when we say of chronic RV pacing is RV apical pacing. It induces electrical dyssynchrony and uh, subsequent mechanical dysynchrony, which leads on to LV remodeling, left ventricular dilation, functional mitral regurgitation, progressive decline in the LV ejection fraction, increase in the LV fibrosis and later on leads on to heart failure. It also leads on to LA remodeling and thereby subsequently leading on to increased incidence of atrial fibrillation. This didn't come out of any hypothesis. It actually came out from some, some uh, anecdotal reports and later on was uh, proven in the David trial where they found that patients who had more pacing, like if you compare in the DDDR, arm versus the VVI arm. When the mean pacing in the DDR arm was 60%, they had higher incidence of heart failure admissions and mortality compared to the VVI arm where the pacing was 3.5%. So increased heart failure hospitalization and mortality was predominantly because of increased RV pacing. At this point of pacing induced LV dysfunction and worsening of heart failure was put forth by this trial first. Then they looked at whether there is some absolute threshold of uh, uh, the uh, quantum of pacing that would make a difference between patients who were less paced and more paced and whether they were higher incidence of uh, uh, LV dysfunction if people were more paced. And this was answered more in the post trial. Again, people who had uh, EF less than 40%, if there was more than 40% pacing, actually the, the ventricular pacing uh, was more than 40% of time, they had higher incidence of both heart failure and atrial fibrillation. So clearly, RV apical pacing would induce uh, left ventricular dysfunction, LV remodeling, heart failure, and atrial completion on the long term, and we needed to reduce RV apical pacing. So the easiest way of tracking this was, there were a lot of solutions that was thought into this. The easiest way that was tried was first to minimize ventricular pacing by using the various algorithms, which were incorporated by each vendor in different ways. Like Medtronic would call it, call it MVP or managed ventricular pacing. Uh, St. Jude or the Abbott would call it ventricular intrinsic preference. Boston would call it rhythmic or AV search plus. So, so on and so with numerous uh, uh, algorithms came from each vendor and was tested in trials. But none of them were really successful because when we tried to do these uh, device algorithms, we found that AV and VV synchrony were sa sacrificed at the expense of reducing ventricular pacing, especially in patients with prolonged AV delays. And sometimes this tend to be non-physiologic and even sometimes pro arrhythmic And that is why this was, given, this was abandoned. Although you find a lot of these algorithms still in many of the, uh, many, many of the devices. Then they looked at, they thought that it was the RV apical pacing that was the villain and say they looked at non-apical pacing site. So alternate site pacing, that was the second uh, venture. And they looked at the RV outflow track pacing or rather 
do are we mid septum pacing are we high high are we outflow track pacing and uh, although theoretically all these uh, was presumed to reduce the incidence of pacing induced cardiomyopathy that was not what we saw in trials or real world data unfortunately this is another uh, systematic review and meta analysis and the meta analysis looking at all these trials comparing rv apical pacing versus rv non apical pacing so rv apical pacing on one side all the other sites of non apical pacing on the other side unfortunately there is no difference no reduction in heart failure no reduction in atrial fibrillation and this happens predominantly because of we know that every patient is different the anatomy is different there is inaccurate uh, uh, site uh, the inaccurate selection of site of pacing it's predominantly related to what we call one uh, uh, although what was presumed by Harry Mont as the RV outflow track which would reduce uh, pacing induced cardiomyopathy the same said most of them would not reach and the the presumed rv outflow track on the ct scan uh, had uh, different locations in different patients so because of the fluoroscopic limitation the exact site was never reached and that is why there were a lot of variable results among operators and that is why on large scale this didn't succeed in reducing pacing induced cardiomyopathy Clearly, once you have this, the answer is clearly by V pacing, and that is the standard of care for all patients with pacing induced cardiomyopathy. And this was uh, put forth uh, in patients who underwent AV junction ablation for uh, atrial fibrillation fast ventricular rates. In these patients, we all know that once you have ablated the AV junction, they are going to be fully pacing dependent. And there were trials which showed that by V pacing in these patients would reduce the incidence of heart failure. But this was not uniform. This is another trial biopace where they looked at all patients with PR under more than 220 milliseconds. They gave a by V pacing, and unfortunately, by V pacing was not superior to uh, right ventricular pacing, both in patients with normal ejection fraction and in patients with EF less than 50%. Both the mortality and heart failure both was not reduced with by V pacing. So clearly, by V pacing was not the answer to. Pacing induced cardiomyopathy, and that is why we needed something really out of box, and that is why physiologic pacing predominantly came came into practice. Although it all started off with his bundle pacing, now it's actually all given way to left bundle pacing. So when we call conduct system pacing, it was actually it was started off as his bundle pacing. Now we have only few operators still uh, doing. His bundle pacing predominantly majority have shifted to left bundle pacing for various reasons, which I will be alluding to in the in, uh, in the further slides. So first of all, why physiologic pacing? Predominantly, the idea of physio <coughs> conduct system pacing or physiologic pacing is to eliminate the risk of pacing induced cardiomyopathy in BRADI patients and thereby improving the and also improving therapy in CRT patients. Why physiologic pacing? Simply because it replicates human physiology. We all know by evolution that his Purkinje system, as God has designed it, is simply the most efficient way to activate the ventricles. You need to understand that when somebody is pacing the his bundle, you are actually pacing from the right atrium that I'll be alluding to subsequently. But you have both you have both the RA lead as well as the RV lead in the right atrium, and so there's hardly any issue of tricuspid valve uh, uh, tricuspid valve uh, <coughs> damage from the pacing lead. Not like a spiral regurgitation from the pacing lead because the right ventricular lead is also on the membranous sector. The AV and VV synchrony has achieved, and there is absolutely no risk of pacing induced dyssynchrony or cardiomyopathy. In fact, the first bundle pacing was done by Narula way back in 1977, but for a long time there was an there was no significant advancement in this line, and the first. Series of patients who underwent permanent his bundle pacing was done by Deshmukh and was published in Circulation, where in 18 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy with chronic atrial fibrillation who underwent AV junction ablation, he did it in successfully in 12 patients with a pacing threshold of 2.4. With an improvement in the EF from 20%, 31%, and unfortunately, out of these 12 patients, two patients had lead dislodgements. Although the results didn't look so great, but it was definitely worth pursuing. So this is where we actually target in his bundle pacing. So his bundle pacing, as you, as I said, you don't have to cross the tricuspid valve. You actually target it somewhere in the membranous septum, that is the AB septum, the septum adjoining from the right atrium to the left ventricle. The membranous septum by the penetrating bundle of his goes in. That's where we actually place the lead for capturing his bundle. Obviously, it is based on the electrograms, which show this kind of sharp his bundle potentials, large ventricular electrograms, and small atrial electrograms. So, this is the site for his bundle piecing. 
and we have uh, dedicated tools. This is a 3830 uh, French lead from Medtronic. This was although initially designed for something else, but now it has been propagated for or uh, re being marketed for his bundle pacing. We have selected, we have the specific catheters which take this lead to the site of his bundle. That is the, three, uh, the C315 his sheet. That is what we have. And the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, the Americans have this 304 deflectable catheter as well, which might be handy in some difficult anatomies, although we don't have it with us at this moment. Biotronic uh, has its own sets of um, sheets, which is the, called the Selectra 3D sheets. Metronic actually launched up the His Bundle tools initially. Now it is available with uh, both Biotronic as well as Abbott. Biotronic has the Selectra 3D sheets. Um, uh, Abbott has the His Pro Agilis sheet. Uh, so advantage with the Selectra 3D sheets and the, uh, uh, the His Pro Abbott uh, uh, Agilis sheet is that you can use the conventional pacing lead, that's the soleus lead or the, the, the 5.6 uh, conventional pacing lead. Only thing you need to use these dedicated sheets, which are 3D sheets, which take these leads specifically to the septum. The Selectra sheets are available in uh, three lengths, 40, 55, and 65, based on the anatomy you are looking at. But 55, I, I understand, is the most common sheet that is being used. So this is just some examples of how beautiful the paced QRS are in patients who undergo his bundle pacing. So you can see one example on the left, another example on the right. Sinus node, six sinus syndrome, somebody put a uh, 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 conduction stem pacing, and you can see how narrow the paced QRS is. It's almost as narrow as the native QRS. It's actually it's just like the native QRS, as narrow as the native QRS, paced QRS duration of 78 milliseconds, which can never be achieved with any form of set. Pacing. This is another patient with AV block who underwent a conduct system pacing, a his bundle pacing precisely. And you can see how narrow the QRS is. The paste QRS looks just similar to the native, uh, uh, native QRS, and the paste QRS duration is 86 milliseconds. This is how narrow and sleek the conduct system pacing QRS look like. Some terminologies, when we call his bundle pacing, when we say selective his bundle pacing, that means you have the paste QRS would look just similar to the intrinsic QRS complex. And there would be an isoelectric line between the pacing stem to the QRS, which would be exactly equal to the intrinsic HV interval. So this is how, this is an example of a selective his bundle pacing. You have a pacing stem followed by an isoelectric line, which is equivalent to the HV interval. And then you have a QRS, which is just similar to the intrinsic QRS. So you're exactly pacing on the his bundle alone, no myocardial capture at all. There's something called non-selective uh, his bundle pacing. So non-selective his bundle pacing involves capture of both the myocardium as well as the conduction stuff tissue. So you have a pacing stem followed by a delta or a slur in the QRS, which indicates local myocardial capture. And then you have a QRS, which is actually a fusion activation from the conduct system as well as the myocardial capture. And it would be narrow one. So is it all uh, just a talk, physiologic talk or is, do you have evidence with conduct system pacing? The initial his bundle pacing studies were primarily small, single center, non-randomized clinical studies. And these are the numerous uh, studies that were published in various indications from AV block to six sinus to patients undergoing AV junction ablation. Subsequently, we had larger studies. So this is the biggest study published so far by Sanon in uh, 2019, which looked at the long-term performance and safety of his bundle pacing, a multi-center experience. Uh, so it, it had data from 44 patients from 2004 to 2016, and they concluded that permanent his bundle pacing was safe and effective on long-term follow-up. And uh, this is the uh, multi-center experience involving about 844 patients. This is the biggest study published so far. You have the study, the longest follow-up published by the, the pioneer in uh, conduct system pacing, that is Vijay Raman, sir. He is actually the, the uh, who came and taught all of us to conduct system pacing in India. Um, uh, his sir's publication was this uh, permanent, his bundle pacing, a long-term lead performance with a five-year follow-up data, which he concluded that 
permanent respiratory patient was associated with a reduction in death and heart failure hospitalization during follow up on five year follow up compared to rv apical pacing and unfortunately his bundle pacing was associated with higher rates of lead revision and generator change this was the longest follow up from bijar raman sir and then the begus meta analysis that was published uh, was in 2020 which had data from uh, 2348 patients on from 13 studies which looked at the long term therapeutic effects of hispergus system pacing on bradi and cardiac system dysfunction compared to rv pacing and it fo- found that his bundle pacing was more suitable for treatment of patients with bradycardia and cardiac system disease than rv apical pacing so meta analysis concluded that his bundle pacing was clearly superior to rv apical pacing but why didn't we stop with his bundle pacing it's predominantly because his bundle pacing had its own limitations sometimes you would you would, there, there would be a failure of implant in about 10 to 20% of patients because of infraxian block you might end up with a higher threshold in 10 to 15% of patients 3% of patients might require lead, uh, lead revisions ventricular under sensing would be there because of small r waves you would have far field atrial over sensing you would sometimes have atrial capture because you are primarily pacing from the atrial side or uh, from the right atrium you would also have a small risk of injury to his bundle of 1% risk of h transient hv block and 2 to 3% risk of right bundle branch block so primarily the major concern was progress was unstable thresholds on the long term and inability to get a good narrow qrs in patients with infraxian block and a need for lead revision and higher battery consumption on the long term so clearly people were looking for something beyond his bundle and that's why we left it in it left bundle why left bundle was uh, considered superior to his bundle clearly the answer is the limitations of the his bundle pacing so his bundle you are trying to target a very narrow narrow target you are trying to hit in through the membrane septum on the narrow his bundle and there is higher risk of lead dislodgement higher risk of lead revisions rise in thresholds progressively over time under sensing over time and early battery depletion and that is probably why we why we all have shifted to left bundle pacing by definition requires capture of left bundle trunk or the proximal fascicle uh, usually with the rv septal myocardium at a lower output and the criteria is that the paced qrs should have a qr in v1 or a right bundle branch block morphology or you should demonstrate left bundle potential the lv activation time should be between 70 to 90 milliseconds and there should be evidence of cardiac stem pacing in the transition from selective to non selective left bundle So this is the Huang's technique where you take in the venous axis in the RVO position you locate where the distal his is and the typical target for targeting the left bundle trunk is uh, 1 to 1.5 cm below and apical to from the his bundle location pace this location if the pace qrs has a w morphology with a notch close to the nadir in v1 then that's a site where you want to screw in you need to screw the lead slowly with the sheath kept perpendicular to septum and as you go deeper in you can see that the notch which was on the nadir slowly goes up and this notch finally becomes the qr in v1 with deeper fixation you can also sometimes observe left bundle potential and as you go in deeper you finally get a qr which confirms that you are on the left side of le- left ventricular endocardial and once you have got into this side just slit up uh, just uh, slit the sheet and uh, confirm the pacing parameters and during all this implant you need to monitor unipolar impedance to ensure that you are not perforated the septum so this is the typical location and, and as you are on the rv subendocardium this is how the paced morphology would look like typical location would have lead two positive lead three negative avr negative avl positive and b1 would have this w pattern with the notch on the uh, on on the uh, upper, upper uh, on the slant of the v1 and as you go deeper as you reach mid septum you can see the notch ascending upon v1 and as you reach the lv subendocardium you have this typical qr pattern and that's where you typically stop screwing in further and check for the electrical parameters and this is a video of how we plan for moving on from the rao enter that on septum and on the lao you start screwing in you can see uh, you can see clearly the lead uh, screwing in going into the uh, myocardium going into the septal myocardium and reaching the lv side of the um uh, lv side of the ventricular septum and capturing the left fascicle left bundle main trunk so this is the exact site so this is where his bundle catheter is 1.1.5 cm apical and downwards apical and downwards 
from the location of this bundle. That's where you exactly try to screw it. And one more concept is the LV activation time. That is from the pacing stint to the onset of to the, to the peak of our wave in V5 or V6, which indicates the LV conduct LV activation time. And on the RV, on the RV part, you will have the LV, uh, the LV activation time above 90 milliseconds and it would be it would remain similar at low output and high output as you go in deeper you will find shortening of the LV activation time as you place at higher output because on higher output you are capturing the conduct system on the left side and as you reach the final side the LV activation time remains less than 70 milliseconds on low output as well as high output because you have captured the left bundle trunk or the fascicles. Some of other frontiers with conduct system pacing, typically this is also useful or in fact the way forward in patients with refractory atrial fibrillation with recurrent heart failure hospitalization because of fast ventricular rate, patients who have tachycardiomyopathy because of fast ventricular rate with atrial fibrillation, the best treatment is to do an AV junction ablation and place a left bundle, left bundle pacing uh, in these patients with, uh, with a single chamber pacer that forms a solution for most of these patients with recurrent heart failure and uh, atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate. AV junction ablation and left bundle pacing can be done in the same setting as well as done in this case. So we have atrial fibrillation, fast ventricular rate, have AV junction ablation done and a uh, left bundle pacing lead implanted. One of the other ways, this would also become a poor man CRT. So this is an example where the patient had dilated cardiomyopathy, EF30%, QRS duration of 160 milliseconds, typical left bundle branch block, could not afford a CRT, was on medical therapy. You can easily implant a dual chamber pacer with, uh, with RV lead being placed on the left bundle. If the RV lead is captured in the left bundle, this is how narrow the QRS becomes from 160 milliseconds to 88 milliseconds. And this patient had a phenomenal improvement in the ejection fraction from 30% to 60%, sometimes or, or much more than what we were expecting, even from a CRT, uh, almost like quantifying like a super responder to CRT. Other option is in non-LBB morphologies, like an RBB morphology with heart failure, where we all know the typical CRT would not work. His bundle pacing can narrow the QRS and reduce the QRS duration and restore synchrony and reduce heart failure. One other extension is what we call left bundle optimized CRT or lot CRT, where you take the advantage of best of both the worlds. That is, the you have both the uh, LB epicardial lead as well as the left bundle lead and uh, is how it improves the response. You have a patient with left bundle branch block on LV pacing. This is how narrow it is on LV, 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 LV epicardial pacing. This is what it is, QRS is. And when you have left bundle optimized CRT, when you are pacing from the coronary sinus lead based on the postnatal uh, vein and the left bundle lead, this is how narrow and a sleek QRS you are going to get and you are definitely going to improve the response rate. And there's publication from Vijay Ramansar's group itself, which showed that left bundle pacing is a feasible and safe and excellent alternative to CRT with significant improvement in the ejection fraction, especially in patients with left bundle branch block and also in some patients with non-left bundle branch block as well. So uh, just a, a snapshot of his bundle versus left bundle. His bundle is definitely more physiologic. You can get the narrowest of all the QRSs, but it is it has its own issue of trying to target a narrow region, higher unstable thresholds, uh, the higher dislodgement rates, slight increase in uh, definite in, uh, concern of late increase in threshold. And, uh, and, and you can, uh, you have significant data with his bundle. Left bundle pacing, uh, on the other hand, you have wider target to target. You have, uh, yeah, you have better thresholds, you have stable thresholds, lesser dislodgement rate, lesser increase in late rising threshold, good battery life, good R waves. If you are using for a lot CRT and all, you have good R waves, which would give a good uh, sensing for the ICV as well, and better bundle branch collector, even if there is an uh, infrasian block. And technically, it is much easier than this. And finally, I would conclude with the guidelines because most of them were asking about the indication for conduct system pacing. Currently, as per the ESE guidelines, it is indicated for patients with tachycardiomyopathy due to refractory uh, uh, supraventricular tachycardia that could not be ablated and are subjected for AV junction ablation. And under, that is a class 1C indication. And there's a two-way indication, again, for similar patients with recurrent multifocalated tachycardias or macron tachycardias, which cannot be ablated. As per the ACCHA, it, is it has a two-way indication for patients with AV block 
with indication for permanent pacing, with e ejection fraction between 36 to 50 percent and percentage predicted pacing being more than 40 percent. There is also a 2B indication for all patients with AV block, which is below the level of AV node. So to conclude, RV apical pacing is associated with adverse clinical outcomes, which includes pacing-induced cardiomyopathy, higher incidence of uh, congestive heart failure, higher incidence of atrial fibrillation, and thereby increased mortality. Physiologic pacing via his bundle pacing and left bundle pacing is definitely the way forward for any patient who requires RV pacing that is more than 40% of time, especially in patients who had EF less than 50%. That's what the ACC AHA guidelines as well say. Physiologic pacing, again, there is a novel option for pay, uh, as an alternative for CRT in heart failure patients, not only in patients who fail by V, it is also useful in patients with non-LBB IVCD morphology. It's also very useful in patients who undergo AV junction ablation and also as an add-on to the conventional CRT in the form of LOT or hot CRT. And finally, physiologic pacing is definitely a new technology. It has limited data. There are concerns again. We still don't know the long-term durability of uh, intramyocardial septal lead. Concerns are definitely there about the lead extraction, uh, the issues with the non-stillet uh, lead, uh, lead that we are using, and definitely the risk of thromboembolism if the screw gets into the LV endocardium. So that's all from my side. I would be happy to take on the questions. Thank, thank you, uh, Arun Gopi, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. Okay, I think uh, the, there are obvious questions. I think from uh, non, non EP people, they're asking without having uh, the EP system, how good they can do left bundle branch area pacing? That's a good question, sir. Um, with his bundle, we wanted wanted the uh, EP system so as we can locate the his bundle potential and all. But with left bundle, you just need your 12 ED, 12 ED ECG alone, actually. You don't require the EP system at all. Um, you can actually, the, most of the PSAs can show you the signals. You just have to look at the, uh, you have to just go anatomical, one to 1.5 centimeters below an apical to the uh, to the uh, his bundle location or where your tricuspid uh, annulus is. Uh, you do not be exactly at even that space. You have a wide target. The left bundle uh, is actually uh, is branching, and you can target it anywhere, wherever you can go across the septum. Just look at the pace morphology. You lead two is positive, lead three is negative, AVR is negative, AVL is positive, and V1 has a notch or W pattern. Just go in deep there, monitoring the unipolar impedance. Just look at the paced QRS morphology. And once you have narrow na narrowing of QRS, a QR pattern in V1 and the LV activation type not further shortening with high output compared to the lower output, you are at the left bundle. You don't require an EP system at all. One more question in the chat box. In which, where do you prefer lot CRT? Definitely. See, lot CRT is ideally indicated in patients who have a non-LBBB, IVCD type of QRS with dilated cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction, which is less than 30%, conventionally indicated for, um, uh, for a resynchronization therapy. So in these cases, these patients have infraisia disease as well, distal cardiac system disease as well. So we, we have the left bundle lead as well as the coronary sinus lead pacing on the LV epicardium. And uh, we'll be surprised to see how, na how narrow the QRS comes when we have these large CRT in these kind of patients. One more question in the chat box. How, how does LV pacing work in left bundle branch block? Yeah, see. Uh, okay. That's uh, the, the, I think I forgot. This is actually the concept why it came is all the fascicles or, or the contact system is actually uh, this time. The, the, the fascicles which are supposed to go for the left bundle and right bundle are actually all pre distinct. And most of the patients with left bundle branch block. Systematic studies have been shown and have conclusively proved that most of the time the block is actually in the his, his the, the, is very much in the proximal conduction system or the proximal his. So if you are able to pace just distal to where the block in the conduct system is, you are definitely going to get a very narrow QRS, and that's why it's able to correct the broad QRS that happens with typical left bundle branch block. 
so it should uh, be just be distal to the site of uh, block yes although we don't map the site of block but uh, one way whenever you are getting you are pacing and you are finding a qrs which is narrow at any site that definitely indicates that the conduct system distal to where we are located is healthy What is your experience with uh, ischemic versus, and, uh, versus non ischemic in uh, left bundle branch pacing? I initially presumed that this would work more for non ischemic uh, and ischemic. I had concerns wherever there was a septal scar and had an old anterior wall extensive scar. But surprisingly, what I have found over time is sometimes even ischemic cardiomyopathy patients respond well to contact system pacing. Although we say that the septum is scarred, there are some areas on the septum which will uh, allow the lead to go through. Actually, in fact, what we have found is sometimes in ischemic cardiomyopathy also you are able to narrow the QRS very much with the conduct system pacing. Um, one thing I would like to add is a lot of people have concerns about septal thickness. It's in fact not the, not the septal thickness that is actually a rate limiting factor for uh, penetrating and getting into the left, uh, left trunk or the fascicle. It's in fact the septal fibrosis or the septal scar. Even if you have a thin septum and you have a lot of fibrosis or septal scar, sometimes the lead just won't go through. On the other hand, a very thick septum, sometimes the lead might just go through. So if you have an ischemic cardiomyopathy, an extensive scarring or significant fibrosis in septum, we might have a tough time going across. But uh, in a lot of cases, we have been able to narrow the QRS even in ischemic cardiomyopathy. How are your all experiences, sir? Yeah, yes, I, I agree with you. Is, is there any difference between uh, 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 four French lead versus a biotronic lead in uh, targeting the septum or uh, screwing into the septum? Um, actually, personally speaking, I didn't find much of difference. Although the, uh, the four French lead looks really, uh, really tiny, actually, when you're fixing the lead and all, it, 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 it can actually be, they say the tensile strength of lead is very good. But um, yeah, while you're fixing the lead and all, you will sometimes feel that the lead is just buckling out. It's really thin and all. Uh, the concern with the conventional lead based in intramyocardial with the biotronic or Abbott system is we really are not very sure how easily will be, um, where, how this lead will come out actually. Uh, on the contrary, the advantage is with, uh, with, um, uh, with these leads, you can use the lead locking stylet at least to pull these leads out. On the other hand, with the uh, with the four front lead, this is luminless. You don't have anything to get in to extract this. Although uh, Metronic says that it is easier to extract, but we don't have any long term data. Dean, sir, your experience. Audio, is sir. On. Sir, you are muted, sir. Arun, that was an excellent uh, review on, on the topic. Yeah, I haven't used bi Biotronic, you know, I'm kind of conservative. Unless I see data, I don't tend to use it. Yeah. So my thinking is anything that uh, goes in easily, uh, it's a trade-off. Uh, uh, people who have used Biotronic say that it's easier to penetrate, uh, especially uh, thicker septums and scar septums. But then again, there is a, a higher chance of penetration is my feeling. So therefore, I haven't used it. So I can't tell you the difference. This is good enough, uh, like Dr. Arun says, uh, extraction, which would be easier is again, we don't know. I remember the articles published by both uh, our own uh, Shanmuga and uh, that extraction has been easy with the Metronic lead too. So I'm not sure. So uh, you, uh, how do you feel Dr. Satish? Yeah, uh, uh, Biotronic leads being bulky and uh, uh, their penetrability is uh, good. Only thing is we are worried about dislodgement uh, because four fence lead with metronic is a lighter lead. Uh, chances of dislodgement are very, very less. I'm worried about dislodgement with uh, biotonic leads. And uh, as, you, as you rightly told, the penetration is much easier with uh, biotonic lead. In fact, you should be very careful because it will easily perforate. Doctor, most of it uh, uh, on the chat box, I think I also got to see most of you have been answered. One question is not on conduction system pacing. I thought if you answer that, that will complete. A difference between septal uh, pacing versus apical pacing. Something in context. Which is best way of pacing, apical versus septal? At any time, theoretically, septal pacing is superior to apical pacing. 
uh, because uh, definitely septal pacing is more physiologic than apical pacing and um, causes less um, electrical and mechanical dyssynchrony. That's yeah, what we all try to target actually when we are the, doing the, the conversion. The, the challenge is uh, positioning the lead in the septum. We are yes. assume that we are in the septum, yes. but if you do CT scan and look, we are uh, near uh, septum and free wall junction. So positioning in the septum is the challenge there. Exactly, sir. Uh, you really nailed it. The issue is we all assume during the implant that we are very septal, but finally uh, we realize that we sometimes might be in the groove between the septum and free wall. We are not yeah. precisely what septal. Is, just not just LAO, RAO, RAO 30 or 45, it's in the middle part. That's the important thing. It should not be very anterior or posterior in the RAO. That's where the septum is. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, fortunately, these uh, sheets actually take precisely to septum. So that is yes. one advantage of all these things. Connection actually. system so, pacing. Yes. Even, even if you don't hit the bundle, you hit the uh, septum and properly, the definitely QRS will be narrower. narrower. There are no complications like pericardial effusion or uh, tamponade. Yes. You agree, Dr. B? Yeah, I agree. Do Dr. I have one. Um... You, uh, Dr. Arun, you uh, gave up, gave away all the trials on uh, left bundle pacing in his bundle. You didn't uh, touch upon the, you know, uh, randomized trials, uh, the his yeah. sync and his alternative. Any thoughts on that? That will give us a perspective of what to do about. Uh, sir, I, so, uh, I, sorry. Sorry. No, his sync and uh, his sync trial and his alternate trial. See, although it looks exciting. Why does it not show difference in the hard endpoints? Like uh, there was a comparative trial between CRT, LV, uh, CS lead CRT and uh, his, his bundle based CRT. There was not significant difference in terms of uh, uh, hard outcomes. So, uh, even in LV, LV function wasn't significantly different. Uh, how do we uh, explain? Is this the choice of the substrate of the patient or? Uh, sir, uh, as far as I understand, that was primarily a non-inferiority uh, trials, actually. They were just looking at uh, showing it to be non-inferior to the traditional CRT. And uh, and that was the concept. And all these, uh, and um, the, the, uh, the, the, when the discussion was there, most of them, the, the, uh, the number of patients were less. And you, this is actually quite premature to say, or you don't have, it was not quite powered enough to say that whether you will have better results on the longer follow-up, actually. Okay, my, my, you you would have a better idea on trials. I'm, no, not, just, uh, I'm not too much into the trials actually. Yes. No, I was only thinking. I see. I think there is a role for CRT. There is a role for uh, conduction system pacing. The more and more we choose uh, patients with pure conduction system disease related LV dysfunction, I think uh, conduction system pacing would uh, fare better. But in in a trial, it's hard to actually get uh, this subset alone. It will always be a combination of ischemic cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Therefore, it'll be hard to create such a large trial to show a difference and probably they'll be equal. Uh, uh, and to get a pure conduction system disease-based LV dysfunction subset of patients will be hard to get that large number. So I'm just trying to ask you if there'll be a distinction. Would you suppose somebody can afford a uh, lot CRT, hot CRT, and it is LVB, LV dysfunction. What would be your choice? You would uh, always you will avoid a LV lead, or you will just go first. That's my question to you, um, sir. I'm still uh, uh, in my personal practice. I still consider doing CRT first because okay. CRT we have maximum data with CRT. I would shift to left bundle only if I'm uh, I have a suboptimal uh, typical uh, coronary sinus lead or a failed CRT. Or if you're not able to narrow it down with the uh, with the conventional CRT, so by default CRT first. Okay. If if I if I fail in the CRT, then this is always a bailout option, not primarily left bundle. Fine. I just wanted to know that. So that's how, at the moment we are all practicing. I thought that we should stress on that. So it's always if somebody can afford the uh, CRT, uh, like you said, it's a bailout, and uh, you use the word pure, poor man's CRT. Yeah. In patients who can't afford. It's a, it's a good alternate, I thought. Yes. Yeah. We are pre very premature to compare left bundle to CRT. We have data with CRT for many uh, for so many years. So CRT is the standard of care. Again, uh, uh, this is an upcoming. Uh, probably we'll have we'll require much much more data 
to place it at par with CRD. I think uh, if there are no questions. Yeah. So, uh, sir, I think um, uh, very interesting discussions. And I think uh, our uh, audience must have, uh, it is evident with the questions coming uh, to the experts. And I think it was worth uh, uh, touching upon this topic. And uh, from Boston Scientific side, I'm grateful to our experts, uh, starting from our expert panelist, Dr. Beam Shankar, Dr. Satish. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and you know enlightening our uh, audience on the subject. I also thank uh, our uh, very good speakers, Dr. Arun and Dr. Hisham, for bringing a lot of you know relevance to the topic with clinical evidence and the practice. With that, I think I uh, uh, also uh, thank our attendees who are uh, you know interacting with the faculty, and uh, you know in in the in the interest of patients, there were different questions, and I think it was very well answered by our faculty. So thank you so much, also, and with your permission, I. Uh, conclude the session and uh, uh, you know so, uh, of the webinar. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Veep, sir. Thank you, Satish. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Record.